And to a certain extent, 2020 was probably a, a turning point uh, because Asia Pacific for the first time really uh, surpassed all the other regions in the world combined in global GDP. Welcome back to another edition of COVID-19 from crisis to creation here on Mentory TV. I'm Patricia falco Bicali, your host. Well, 2020 was a great year for investors if you look at the stock exchanges, globally speaking. But what about the direct investment market, the foreign direct investment market? If you look at the latest report from the UN, the World Investment Report 2020, that's actually been down about 40% during 2020 and is expected to fall another 5 to 10% this year, only to expect a recovery by 2022. Why? Of course, insecurity because of the COVID-19 crisis, geopolitical risk, civil unrest, like for example in Hong Kong, and of course also what we see is a bit of an anti-globalization sentiment filtering into many investors' minds. But there is one region in this world and that is the APEC region, the Asian Pacific region, which still has been outperforming quite stunningly when it comes to direct investments. Why? Well, let's find out what's been happening and what is going to happen this year and the years to come with Nathaniel Naro. He is the CEO and founder of N Strategy Consulting Services. He joins us today, not from the Asian Pacific region, Nathaniel, but from France. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Patricia. Happy New Year. I'm, I'm really, really happy to have you on the show because I talk a lot about equity markets, you know, and the Bitcoin or the digital asset market, which has been really, despite the pandemic, done really well. But you are in a different kind of investment market, and that is when investors invest directly into different regions than they originate from. Give us a little bit of an overview how the foreign direct investment market performed last year in 2020 and what you expect for this year as well and why sure yeah so of course there has been a slowdown even for asia pacific but if you compare um in absolute value and also in percentage it's still going strong um we, we must say and and that is really about the long-term dynamic of this region uh, whether we look at southeast asia itself or asia pacific at large there is really a strong uh, ongoing dynamic and to a certain extent, 2020 was probably a, a turning point uh, because Asia Pacific for the first time really uh, surpassed all the other regions in the world combined in global GDP. So now you have APAC accounting for more than 50% of the global GDP. And most likely what happened in the last year uh, accelerated uh, this process and this phenomenon. And that is driven why? Well, you have a number of factors that are driving this uh, trend. Of course, you can think of the demographic factor, but it has a lot to do with the fact that um, on a, if we speak generally, uh, Asian countries have been catching up for decades now. Uh, others are just catching up now. And you see this kind of uh, technological leap uh, whereby the population of those countries will uh, effectively catch up in terms of technology and daily usage of this technology, uh, which drives a lot of growth uh, and a lot of uh, progress through those societies always. Um, you know, in Europe or in the US, we went through the steps of having uh, one family computer at home in the 90s and then a slightly better one and then the laptop arrived and so on and so forth. Um, in Southeast Asian countries, they are catching up directly to the stage of having the top smartphone uh, and, and that drives new consumption models, uh, but that also means access to market for millions and dozens of millions of individuals across many different countries. Yes. And uh, you mentioned like the statistics that this, this region is really very dynamic. And looking at the research, one thing is the FDI inflows and the other one is also the outflows where the Asian Pacific region has again hit a very, very high level over the last few years. And if you look at the market itself, I mean, Asia Pacific or Asia including also China and India, accounts for 60% of the world's population. Like 4.5 billion people live there. So in terms of economic power and also the rise from developing countries to more developed countries is where the opportunity lies, right? Absolutely. And just the precision when I was saying 
more than 50% of the global GDP, I was integrating into the APAC bloc, China and India. So that's, that's of course, uh, of importance. Uh, and yeah, no, it's so t totally important. And, and I think another day data bit we need to put our viewers into is that the total foreign direct investment market back in 2019, that's the latest statistics we can bring, even though it's already 21, was about 1.54 trillion US dollars. And a stunning 45% was actually happening in the Asian Pacific region, which was flabbergasting to me. And within that amount, 90% go towards developing countries, which I thought also was an interesting one. You mentioned already already the tech sector. Let's go before we look at the tech sector, first of all, the regions. What attracts non-Asian Pacific people to invest in that region most of all? Yeah, so I mentioned the demographics and beyond that there is a strong uh, adaptability in the, the population of those countries, which means also faster uh, change and faster move, right? Uh, and to a larger extent, what's also sometimes surprise the, the companies we, we work with when it, when it comes to going into Asia-Pacific is the speed at which things can progress, uh, which is far from some um, you know, misconception that uh, some people may have. And it's not rare that some of the companies we work with, whether they are from Europe or the US, are really amazed by how fast we are progressing in specifically Southeast Asian markets. Yeah, and uh, I prepared a screen share for us, uh, Nathaniel. Let me please share this one with you. Let me quickly interrupt the conversation to say thank you that you are here with me on the channel. If you do enjoy what I'm putting out, the in-depth kind of conversations, then why don't you subscribe and also hit the bell button so I can keep you informed with our newest releases. Thanks for that in advance, and let's get back to the conversation. And it's this one I wanted to talk about. And that is really the ease of doing business. And you just mentioned it. You know, if something goes speedy, that means also that the system is started to map out to uh, go easy. And I think interesting factors here are, of course, um, you know, how long does it take for an entrepreneur to open a business? How much does it cost? What are the other kind of labor market uh, situations for anybody to hire, potentially fire labor force? Can you take us a little bit through the details there? Yes, yeah, sure. So um, from one country to another, it would be, of course, very different. Um, what makes, um, I would say, a huge line in the middle is the countries that will allow foreign investors to own a majority or even 100% of the shares of the company that they will open in Southeast Asia or in Asia Pacific. And you have a few countries that are allowing this, which makes it um, even more attractive for investors. In the previous image, you had Singapore on top of the list. And one of the big reasons is that uh, as a foreign investor, you can own 100% uh, of the shares of your entity there, and it's the same uh, in Malaysia. Uh, many of the other countries that are listed here are progressing toward a more open economy, and uh, I can name Vietnam as a very interesting example, um, because the difference uh, between Vietnam, even just five years ago, and Vietnam as of today, is really amazing. Like, they are not, of course, yet as uh, experienced in, in those fields as Singapore or Malaysia can be, but they are progressing super quickly. Uh, and so that's true that it is something that makes foreign investors quite appealed by the region. Um, the ability to create your business and to open the bank account, to obtain visa and so on. So from one country to another, it's very different. But the big picture is that there is um, a global evolution toward more ease of doing business, uh, which is super interesting for foreign investors and foreign entrepreneurs. So what are the main obstacles? You would say, I'm going to stop sharing now. What are the main obstacles for investors still to get into the Asian Pacific market? Because if I look at the, the, the ranking, for example, of the Asia, ASEAN countries, that is that economic block created, I think there were 600 million people and in 2030 is expected the, to be the fourth largest economy, you know, globally speaking. So it's going to be a real force to reckon with for us that we sit in Europe here, Nathaniel, and also for the US. So you mentioned Singapore and it was also on the top of the list as a destination for FDI. Yeah. Uh, but then I look for Malaysia is number 12 and then you have, you have Vietnam is only number 70, Indonesia 73 and Myanmar 100 
165. That is like the ranking list of, uh, you know, all the countries in the world and the ease of doing business. So whilst it seems that the lion's share of FDI still goes into developing countries, you know, there, there must be still some obstacles which are, you know, holding investors back. Yeah, of course. Um, I think the main obstacle is the cultural alignment, um, which can bring a lot of different uh, issues or uh, different obstacles to, to foreign investors and foreign entrepreneurs. So the first thing to do, of course, is to have a, a good understanding of uh, the country you are willing to invest in uh, and to have trustworthy partners locally, whether people from the country or foreigners who have been established there for a while with similar, if possible, Uh, capacity in terms of being the local partner and so on and so forth. That makes a huge difference, right? Um, then in terms of the, the countries that you were mentioning, the nature of those investments, um, those investments are extremely different in nature where you will find a lot of financial activity in Singapore, for instance, or like HQ, regional HQ for a number of companies that's very often used. Uh, whereas in countries like Myanmar or less developed economies, you will find more investment in the primary sectors. Um, so, of course, it, that, that explains also why you see different countries at different levels. Uh, but the overall trend is definitely on the, growing, um, on the growth for, for all of those. Yeah, and it's amazing what you are saying because it makes me think of where the most money goes in terms of sectors. And I think 2018, it was 66% in the service sector. And that is everything but the agricultural sector, of course. Is that, is that a trend that is going to accelerate? And will those countries such as Vietnam and Cambodia, which are still difficult countries to invest in, really move towards digitization? Or will main investors still look at potentially agriculture or property? Yeah, so in Vietnam, you already have a number of digital companies that have been growing for, for quite some years. And again, I, I'm really impressed you know, with the, the progresses of Vietnam. Um, even sometimes when I happen to go there after, I don't know, 12 to 18 months, uh, I can see a huge difference uh, and huge uh, progresses in just 12 or 18 months. So that, that's quite impressive. And Actually, in Vietnam, you already have a diversity of investments. So, of course, you still have manufacturing activities, uh, especially in northern Vietnam, but also around Ho Chi Minh City in the south. Uh, but you also have uh, some very fast-growing digital companies um, that are serving Vietnam, and by extension, some of them willing to cover also Cambodia, Laos, etc. Um, then, of course, if you look at uh, countries like Laos or Cambodia, it's still a little bit different, although there are also initiatives from governments, uh, especially I'm thinking of Cambodia, to bring in foreign investors and foreign entrepreneurs in the new technology. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you mentioned now Vietnam quite a few times. I was lucky enough to have visited south of Vietnam um, two years, two and a half years ago by now fell totally in love with the country, with the people, and the food is amazing. So it's uh, definitely right. one of my top ranked, really clean, healthy, super, super food. And so I was kind of investigating and like, oh, I wouldn't mind a holiday home here. So how about it? But let's talk two and a half years ago. And I was back then still hearing that it's really, really tough. You need to have a uh, a local companion or partner or somebody buying it for you and it's still very risky to just put your money in. Apart from you can't really, there's still the state quite controls what and what you cannot buy. But I thought it was interesting that you say that now the digitization process is also filtering in to countries such as Vietnam, potentially even Cambodia or Laos. Yeah, no, exactly. And even in terms of uh, ownership of properties, it's made also easier. Uh, so it's not yet as uh, open as it might be in, in Singapore or in Malaysia, for instance, but there are ways and, and you have a very growing number of investors, um, including from China, who are coming into Vietnam uh, and especially the prime uh, real estate market of uh, Ho Chi Minh City. Yeah, and I think this is the interesting one because the intra ASEAN investments is very active with uh, India and China playing a big role, investing a lot in their own region. <coughs> How does that come, that dynamic? Yeah, it's a very strong dynamic um, and, and you can see it in, in many sectors, whether it's uh, construction or uh, some, so let's say some more traditional uh, parts of the economy, as well as in a very uh, advanced or very digital um, aspect of the economy. And 
you can think in that uh, regards, for instance, of the, the fact that Alibaba bought over the main uh, e-commerce players, uh, Lazada, uh, in Southeast Asia, who was funded by some people from Rocket Internet. So initially from Europe, creating in Southeast Asia kind of a copycat of their success in Europe, and then being acquired years after by um, Alibaba. So this one, of course, is very uh, important and interesting because at the same time, you see that Amazon is also investing massively in the region. Um, not yet so much on the e-commerce uh, as consumer aspect of things, but more on the web services for now. But this is coming as well. You have another very interesting example in the ride hailing, you know, ride ordering uh, industry whereby Uber actually got out of Southeast Asia um, and was actually acquired 28% of Grab, which was initially called My Taxi, Malaysian company, which migrated to Singapore and then took the leadership of all the ride uh, ordering in Southeast Asia. So this is really a massive business because you have a strong, very strong um, culture of using taxi or using you know, cars to move around, uh, including for myself, I'm a very regular user. And so when this arrived, it was really a revolution. The My Taxi, then the Grab, then you had competition with Uber for a few years. Um, and it's, again, interesting because you see that you have like large Asian players, again, the, the largest American player. So it also shows a little bit in terms of uh, how the economy resonates with the geopolitical background in Absolutely. that particular region. Absolutely. And I think this is a super point to hit at because um, it seems that the trade war, if you want to call it that way, between the US and China has not necessarily resulted in people really going back and retrenching their investments. If nothing else, what I've seen from what I've read is that a lot of the companies started to build their production hubs in Asia because of a consequence. So rather than producing back in the States or in Europe, they're going like, oh no, we don't know where the trade war may be taking us. But one thing for sure, if we produce over where we also deliver, we have a good bet. Yeah, and you see like the, um, the very large uh, tech companies from the US actually increased, keep increasing uh, the size of their regional HQ, which are mostly in Singapore. Uh, and it's a reality for Facebook, it's a reality for Google as well, but it's the same in Zurich also, I think they keep increasing. Yeah. It's, a, it's a global trend. But definitely, they, they keep investing in that region because they know it's full of opportunity uh, and it will be the key driver. It's already the key driver of the economy um, and it's meant to become more and more predominance in the coming years. Yeah, and uh, ASEAN Briefing actually says if anybody wants to invest FDI in the future, the Asian Pacific region offers the most opportunity in the long term. Nobody's really mentioning Europe Nobody's really mentioning too much the U.S., despite that edge, especially from the U.S., when it comes to the technology sector, AI, you know, blockchain, even though Korea, of course, and, and Asia in general, and also the Chinese are starting to now really come out with their own, own coins, endorsing blockchain and endorsing yeah. also digital assets. Let's get more specific at this point, though, Nathaniel, and let's talk about the how, because now we draw a little bit of an overall picture. The how, because this is exactly what you do, and you you, with your company, you, as far as I understand, you bridge potential investors like me sitting in Zurich to invest in that region. So what is the how? And you mentioned early on, you need a local partner. You need to have a look at the culture. You know, the integration process does uh, have some issues. So what would you say are the key steps for somebody to really consider? Yeah, so uh, as far as we are concerned, our focus is really to bridge the gap between the amazing uh, dynamics and opportunities in Southeast Asia and APAC with uh, high-tech entrepreneurs and investors from all over the world. Uh, and interestingly, we, we even have uh, Asian companies and Asian investors coming at us uh, from China, from Japan, for instance, uh, to work with us toward their success in Southeast Asia. So most of the companies and most of the investors we work with are from Western Europe or North America. But we also have projects originating from the Middle East, from Asia, and so forth. So essentially, we do three main things. There is all the preliminary assessment, which is more, uh, which relates more to kind of a consulting work. Um, and this is only to prepare the execution part, which is the most exciting for us. 
whereby we will actually identify and negotiate contracts uh, with end users for the companies we work with. So this end user may be a large Asian enterprise, for instance, or it may be a government because we are very involved um, in sectors such as health, education, mobility, and so on and so forth. So we work with a number of governments in the region, which is extremely interesting because it gives also a very clear picture of how fast they want to move and where they want to be in five years and 10 years, etc. So yes, uh, those are the two first aspects. And then the third aspect for us is the investment because we are making a few times per year some co-investment uh, with companies that we work with. Uh, and that comes along with the fact that we are able to uh, incorporate and run by ourselves regional entities on behalf of the companies we represent. So that really answers the need for a trustworthy local partner. And of course, you cannot do that in every country. As we were saying earlier, in certain countries, you cannot be as a foreigner, even if you're permanent resident, uh, you cannot be the local partner. But in certain countries, you can, and, and especially in Malaysia or in Singapore. I think this is very intriguing. You know, you're a Frenchman. <laughs> but then again, you are the one bridging, you know, let's say European investors to an area which is not your DNA, not your blood. And you mentioned earlier on also the integration and the cultural integration process, how important it is. I do suspect you have a local team. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So we have over 60 people of which more than half are local in their own country, in their own geography. So that makes a huge difference. Um, you know, we... Is, those are some of the best practices that I've had the chance to observe during my years in, in large companies, whereby the teams were made mostly of local people, uh, because of course you need that uh, for many aspects, but also in terms of cultural understanding, it's extremely useful. Uh, so I've been myself for 10 years in Asia, uh, and of course we keep working heavily and, and with a lot of interest with mostly local people uh, in each of the geographies where we are active. Yeah, I think the local people is exactly the key point here. And it is, and you know, in China, I think you call them the local crocodiles that set up uh, your business in a way. Now, going even more into details, you have greenfield operations and you have brownfield operations or the option for really investing in that country. Can you tell us a little bit what the pros and cons are to, you know, start from scratch, Greenfield, or to take an existing entity over? And is that something that is really of interest or difference to a lot of these uh, clients you have? So most of the time we work with uh, software companies. Um, so there is less constraints in terms of setting up, for instance, manufacturing facilities or, or anything and such. So for us, it, it gives us an edge in terms of being able to, to start afresh in the region and to be completely in control of the operations in Southeast Asia or in Asia Pacific. So that is, uh, of course, very important. But whenever we need to have also some um, facilities, for instance, in uh, IoT, we've had some very exciting projects in the medical field with IoT devices and same in connectivity projects with IoT. Then you need to work with local partners or you can create from scratch your own uh, factory That requires, of course, a certain level of investment, but there is a possibility here. And what is very useful, again, is the connection with the local governments because you can get some extremely attractive incentives uh, to come over. So it can be, for instance, in terms of tax, uh, tax rebate. It can be in terms of uh, having um, a land for a reasonable price and so on and so forth. So we would adjust depending on what are the requirements of the businesses. Uh, whether there is a need for a physical facility or not. Yeah, and the labor force. I mean, you mentioned now a couple of times working closely together with the government. I guess it's both ways. They're listening exactly. to looking, what are investors looking for and they are adjusting, potentially adjusting, yes. um, you know, facilitating. But what about the labor force? Because if I look at the ease of doing business, of course, how easy you can hire and fire but is one thing. But what is really interesting here, if the government says, yes, but you have to have a certain amount of local people working for your, let's say, tech company. Is yep. that feasible? Are they educated? 
And that's it for the first part of my conversation with Nathaniel Nelro about the ins and outs of foreign direct investment, especially when it comes to the Asian Pacific region. And if you do like my videos here on Mentory TV, think they are insightful and of added value, why don't you give us a thumbs up and also subscribe for free, hit the bell button, and I will always keep you informed about my latest videos out there.